Hey, God bless everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this issue. My goal here will not be to convince anyone of my view or change your mind. I mean, I'm a cartoon after all. My hope is that I might get you to think about your position, even if you happen to be Thomistic like myself. There are two things I want to accomplish in my opening. I want to start by showing why I don't take physicalism seriously. Then I want to explain the Thomistic view, as I don't think many know what it is and why it convinced me. So the first problem that I see within physicalism is this idea of, well, how do you get something like awareness, like a thing that is aware of its surroundings? Just that, not, not like full-blown consciousness, just how do we even just get to awareness where something becomes aware of its surroundings and, and is able to move autonomously? Let me give an example of what I mean, because there are certain kinds of emergent properties that are believable because there's a logical foundation for how they can arise because really they're just the sum of the parts of the fundamental things that exist. So for, for example, could you imagine an emergent property like a square coming from just these properties? We have points, space, time, extension, duplication. Now, if you think about it for a moment, it makes logical sense how we can derive a square from these. For example, the first thing we can do is, well, if we have duplication and we have extinction, well, we can duplicate in space, we can duplicate across in time because it takes would take time to do this. Now, you don't actually have, you actually don't need time. You can say that this is an eternal thing that happens all and solely at once, and so there's only an ontological relation between them. But nonetheless, we'll just include time just because. And so now you have this duplication process that extends, in this case, on, the, on this axis, the left and right axis. We'll call that the x-axis, as it is in programming. So now we have something that's not quite a line, but we can imagine it being a line. Because if we continue to extend this out where the circles are very close together, well, then we're going to get a line. So we can imagine that. So after, after we have the duplication with, you know, through extension of the x-axis through time and space, we then get something that starts to resemble a line. If we do that many times, you know, where they're very close together, we get something that's a line. In fact, the way that Photoshop draws this line is just like that. It takes a circle and it draws them very close together over the, over the time that you move your pin. And that's how you get this nice line. So now I have a line. If I then take that line and I move it in space or I extend it in space, well, in this case, I have to turn it to, let me go to the exact one I want here. Okay, here we go. So I take that line and I can move it or extend it in space to a different position. So now I have a duplication of that line. Well, now I have something that starts to resemble a square. If I were to then take that same line and I were to, I guess, well, maybe we'd also need a way to move. Like there needs some, some, so maybe up here I should also put movement or rotation or something. Because right now there's really not a way with just these, there's no, we can't just duplicate or extend something to cause it to exist in a different orientation. And that's what we need in order to have a square. So we'll add, we'll add rotation up here. So if we then rotate this line, we get this. And if we then duplicate that line, we get this. Now we have a square. So let me go ahead and add up here really fast. So as a fundamental property of this world, now we have rotation. So with just point, space, time, extension, duplication, rotation, we can create or you know, get to the point where a square can come into existence. It makes sense within this world with just these fundamental properties that we can somehow get a square out of it. So it might have seemed kind of weird at first if we just started with these fundamental properties of that world that somehow a square could emerge, but it makes logical sense how a square can emerge. I can accept this kind of emergence because, I mean, this shape of a square is not found anywhere in any one of these particular things but it's a, a logical application of these properties that we get a square. So I have searched and searched and searched for any philosophers that have come up with a way to do, to do something similar to this, to describe how do we get awareness and autonomy, like an autonomous aware thing, something that moves by itself on its own, not because it's, you know, let's say, um, magnets, for example. Well, that's not, a magnet isn't moving autonomously. Right? So if this was a magnet and it's attracted to this, these words up here, it might have movement, but that's not 
autonomous movement and it's not it doesn't have any awareness right there's just a magnetic force that's pulling it right that's that would be some sort of fundamental property of attraction and so if we think about the fundamental properties of the world and you can make them whatever you want to be uh, they just have to adhere to physicalism so you might have charge electrons you might have you know push or you can say attraction and repulsion now you might want to add more fundamental properties, but let's say we have attraction, repulsion, charge, space, and time. Well, with that, we can imagine if we had, you know, two balls, for example, we can imagine that they have an attraction, attractive force, and they attract it together. Now, as they're being attracted together, then in relation to each other, we have something happening over time, which would be movement. So we can account for movement, even though movement isn't part of this, you know, these fundamental properties. We have attraction, repulsion, charge, space, and time. Movement is an emergent property, but it's a logical emergent property because we can imagine how it would come about. We can describe how it would come about because these two things have an attractive force between them or they, they just have the power of attraction. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to get like physics. It just has to make logical sense. And so they pull closer and closer together until they're connected. And maybe they connect, you know, really close like this or something. Then eventually you might get something that resembles, if you have enough of them, all bundled together, you get a larger object. Now you have a larger object that could have maybe other properties, like maybe it has a surface attraction. Now that whole thing, the way it works together, that whole surface is now attractive to certain things. And then you have other types of um, objects within the world. I guess you also have to have objects. So I have to put objects up here, whatever those objects are. In this case, maybe they're the very things that have the attraction or the repulsion. We'll call them particles. You might have other particles that, that repulse. And so as they get close together, some of them have a repulsion, some have an attraction, and you have this kind of combination of them. And with that, with that combination of them, you have this kind of interplay where maybe the surface is, you know, attracting certain things but repulsing other things. And that's fine. So now we can imagine different kinds of objects that form within space and time, different shapes. So, so now we have shapes. Now, even though shapes don't exist within, within these fundamental properties, that is this idea of shape. Shape would be an emergent property, but it's a it's a property that makes sense. Just as lines or squares weren't, in, you know, they were emergent property in the example I gave earlier. All this is fine. Like it doesn't it makes sense, right? If you have enough of these things coming together and form some certain within space and time, and they all they all collect together and they extend out in a kind of shape. Right now we have this shape that happens. The same way I showed shape within my with my example of the points extending outward to make a line. That's a shape, and then those extending out to make a square. That's a shape. So we can imagine something similar happening here where you know the movement is just being caused by the attraction pulsion. Uh, maybe we can have duplication here as well. That would be a fine physical fundamental property. And then charge helps these things, you know, have you have orbiting orbits around them, like the electron can orbit around and so forth. That causes a certain kind of property. But but with those properties, how do you logically get from that? You start clumping them together just right, making big clumps of stuff that have certain shapes. They have certain surface tensions. They have certain surface qualities. Like, for example, wetness is just simply the ability for, par for particles, that is the H2O particles, so hydrogen and oxygen particles, to adhere to a surface, right? They, they, there's another surface that attracts, let's say this is a, you know, this is a, a molecule, a H2O molecule, and this is like the surface of something. And so actually, let's just draw a line. And this is the surface of something. It attracts to it, and it sticks. And then when you have a bunch of these sticking to the surface of that object, it changes the surface properties so that light bends through it differently. And this causes what we would call wetness. It makes the surface look more saturated. And it also adds like these kind of highlights because it's reflecting a lot of the water in certain areas. So you have these little highlights here and there. And that's what gives this idea of illusion. There's nothing new there. It's just simply the interplaying of these fundamental things that are, that are interacting with each other. So that makes logical sense how you might have that I mean, whether we want to call it emergent or not, I mean, I mean, I think that's debatable. And the buoyancy is just having, a, not like the water, the buoyancy of water is just having enough of these where they're not super connected, right? Like a, something that's really connected is nice and stiff. You have a bunch of, they're so close together and so stiff, you get something like a brick that's really hard to break apart. But if they're further apart, if the connection is more loose and the, the attractive force is not as strong, then you get something that's like water. If it's really not strong, you get something like air, for example, or a gas. And now I'm going to start to segue into my position of the Thomistic position.
and why it makes more sense to me. So one of the things that comes up is this idea of universals. Universals are things that you can't learn. You have to, I mean, you learn it, but you learn it through experience. You have to abstract it from the world. You can't be taught it by somebody. Someone can't teach you what redness is, right? They, they ha you have to abstract that. They can show you a red object, but that you don't know what redness is yet. For that to happen, you have to see several objects that are different from each other because you have to see the difference between the things. You see like a, a red ball and a red jacket. Well, you see the ball and the jacket are very different. They have very different shapes and textures and whatever. So you can see, well, there's not, what's, what's the sameness about these two things? Because your, your parents try and tell you red, 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 red. So you hear the same word, so you know there's some sameness about them. But what is the sameness about them? And then you, you eventually figure out, after you see enough red objects, you abstract from that, oh, this idea of redness. Well, here's the, the visible light spectrum. These are the colors that exist in the nanometers of light, right? So the photons have different wavelengths, depending on you know, how, how many photons that you have that are coming at you, and so on. And when you have, there's like different um, colors, I guess you can say, to the photons. Not necessarily that photons have colors, but they have these waves, and these different waves have different colors associated with them that, that we would see when, we have, when we're exposed to that wavelength. When we're exposed to these wavelengths, we see red. These wavelengths, we see orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, violet. Notice there's a couple colors on here that are missing. Black is missing. There is no black on here. White is missing. There is no, there is no nanometers for white or black. And there's no nanometers for purple. This isn't purple, this is violet. And the colors that come together to make purple it's weird. It should, purple should fall somewhere in here. If you mix like a blue color and a red color, you get purple. When you, when you, when you mix those two nanometers of light together, if you have a, a light bulb that has these nanometers and a light bulb that has these nanometers or like let's say LEDs or something, you mix them together, you're going to get purple. And purple should follow somewhere as a mixture in between those, but that's green on the color spectrum, right? These numbers. But that's not what you get. You get a, you get a nice vibrant purple color. Well, how is it that the, the mind... How is it, or if you want to say the brain, how is it that the brain comes to associate these nanometers with these colors that don't exist anywhere? White doesn't exist anywhere in the world. When you see white, it's because you're mixing this nanometers, this nanometers, and this nanometers. Blue, green, and red. When you mix, when you mix the light, the light, the blue light with the green light and the red light all together, if you mix those all together and shine them all on a piece of paper, the piece of paper looks white. If you only shine a red light on the white piece of, on the piece of paper, it's not actually white, but uh, we associate it as white. If you put red on it, it looks red. Green, green, blue, blue. But if you mix those three together, suddenly you get something totally different, and now you get white. And that's completely unintuitive. Why would blue, green, and red make white? And what that does is it stimulates the three, the three cones in your eye. That sends a signal to your brain. Your brain then uh, associates that signal with whiteness. But where does it get whiteness from? And same thing with purple. Where does it get the idea of purple? And same thing with black, absence of all color. Why should the absence of all color be, be black? Why do we associate that way? Why not white? We would be just as blind if everything just looked white. So why is it that the brain is able to conjure up these universal ideas, that are, the universal properties, because they apply to many different objects, where does that exist? How does the brain know to do that? And why doesn't it do differently other than it does? And I think the best explanation is the Thomistic view of physics or Aristotelian metaphysics. And that is that, well, they just exist. Now, there's also the Platonic idea, like Plato's forms. But the problem with that, that Aristotle points out some of the problems with that. I don't have time really to go into this, but so first, the basic idea of forms, the Platonic forms, are these non-physical, transcendent, universal properties that are unchanging and they exist in and of, in and of themselves. They're like this, they exist in some abstract realm. They're non-physical. And they determine how the world is, how the world behaves and is, and the, and the world is an imperfection of the forms. Well, Aristotle saw a problem with this. One of the problems he saw with it is that, well, if you have forms like this, then that means there's a form for the human being and there's also a form for the animal. And there's also a form for Socrates and a form for Plato. But that's problematic because Plato would say it's all, there's just one form of human beings, of humanity. 
But the problem with that is, well, then that means that there's no distinction between species and genre, because now you have Socrates and Plato being the same, the same fundamental form, but they're clearly two distinct things, but they're also human beings. So now species, or that is the, the particular, has become the same category as the more abstract or the more, the more general, and that is the human being. And, then, and, and also similarly, the human being has become the more general animal all within the same form. And Aristotle saw that as problematic. So Aristotle believed that forms adhere within objects, within things. So there's still this idea of forms that are, that are non-physical, but they must adhere within physical objects. And by doing that, the form of Plato adheres in Plato, the form of Socrates adheres in Socrates. So there's a distinction between those two forms. One is accounting for how Socrates is Socrates, and one is accounting for how Plato is Plato. And both have this universal principle within them, accounting for how they're human beings and how they're animals um, with, within that uh, of a wider, a, wider, a wider spectrum. And then you have other forms that are adhering just to another kind of animal that say it's adhering to a fox. So it has the foxness within it, and it has the, the broader category of, of animals within it. And so now you can see there's a distinction between these things. You don't have like one form that is accounting for two different particulars, that is Plato and Socrates. You have two distinct forms that are very similar, that share, that share qualities. And these things are like the blueprints. They're instructing the world how to be the way that it is. And so that, to me, that makes more sense. Now, already we have something that's not physicalism because we have these forms that are non-physical things that adhere to physical properties. So everything is a combination. Everything that exists within the universe is a combination of these two things. They are a composite of form and material or, you know, that whatever makes them the object they are. They're accidental properties. But how does this account for awareness? How do we get awareness from this view? Well, Aristotle then goes on to argue from change. So you have change that happens in the world, and change is a real thing. Change happens. Everyone can pretty much agree upon that. But what is change exactly? What's actually happening when we see change? Aristotle says, well, you have to have some potential in order for something to change. If I have a stick, well, it has to have the potential to be on fire. Otherwise, how can it ever be on fire? How can it? How can the thing ever catch on fire or become to be on fire if it doesn't have the potential to be on fire? So it has this potential, but what can actualize that potential? Well, this, this particular potential to be on fire, the stick doesn't have any properties within itself that can logically account for how it would become on fire. It can't just spontaneously combust. It doesn't have those properties to do that. And so it needs some other thing, something else that exists that will cause it to be on fire, such as me with a lighter or um, the sun, if it beats on it hard enough with like a glass or some water droplet or something that concentrates the light in one, one occasion or some sort of friction or something like this. And well, Aristotle says you can't have an infinite, infinite per se chain. I don't know if I have enough time to really go into this. So an infinite causal chain is not the same as a per se chain. A causal chain, like I turned on the AC because it was hot, it was hot because of the sun, so on. That's fine. An infinite per se chain is impossible because it doesn't, it doesn't explain anything. That would be like if I asked you, how is a mirror reflecting a cat? And your answer, instead of saying, well, there's a cat there, you say, well, because it's reflecting another mirror. It's at an angle and it's reflecting this other mirror, mirror B. I'm like, okay, well, how is that mirror reflecting a cat? Well, it's reflecting mirror C. Okay, but how is that mirror reflecting a cat? It's reflecting in it, so on, right? An infinite amount of mirrors doesn't account for how it's reflecting a cat. If you have an infinite set of mirrors, that entire set of infinite mirrors doesn't have the power in of itself to reflect a cat. So it doesn't explain anything. You need a cat somewhere you know, at the beginning of that set of mirrors in order to account for it reflecting a cat to begin with. And this is the problem of an infinite per se chain. It doesn't work because it doesn't account for the powers within the infinite set itself. And well, then if you run this back to things, well, how do things, you know, come to be actualized when, like, how's a, how does an electron come to be actualized? Or how does a, something, you know, the most fundamental stuff come to be actualized? I'm almost out of time. And if you run this backwards, you end up at something that itself has no potentials. That is, you end up at something that is just purely actual. And that he called God. And then using the principles of proportionate causality, we get to the idea of, well, how is consciousness accounted for? 
How is awareness kind of for? It has to be the cause of those things, the actualizing of those things. Well, that means it must have it in some way, even if he only has it virtually. Well, to have virtually consciousness, then you have to have it in some way virtually, which means you have knowledge of it. Like that's one way to have it virtually. But to have knowledge of it means that you you're yourself are knowledgeable. And so it seems that this thing that's purely actual has these properties or not not sorry properties it has the the powers or whatever you want to call it to be knowledgeable about things and therefore it is itself knowledgeable and it's aware of its own knowledge it's a thinking thing so to speak and so this better accounts for consciousness in the universe or even just for something as simple as autonomous awareness or awareness that has autonomy i went like a minute over or like 40 something seconds over <laughs> <laughs>